Hey guys, this is Kevin Budashevsky and this is Cardiovascular Anatomy. So let's start with this high yield image because many patients suffer myocardial infarctions and test question writers can easily integrate findings on ECG to which artery is involved. Coronary arteries originate from the root of the aorta just above the aortic valve cusps. The aortic valve leaflets inside those coronary arteries block the opening to the coronary arteries in systole, which is why most blood enters the coronary arteries in early diastole. The right coronary artery comes from the right side of the aorta, and the left main coronary artery comes from the left side, not surprisingly. The left main coronary artery then passes between the pulmonary trunk and the left atrial appendage, and then divides into the left circumflex and the left anterior descending. The LAD, as indicated in the name, descends anteriorly in the anterior intraventricular groove towards the apex. On this course, it gives off branches to supply the anterior two-thirds of the inner ventricular septum as well as the anterior lateral papillary muscle and anterior surface of the left ventricle. When you're studying for step one, you should try to intuitively understand things based on the concepts that you've learned, rather than relying on endless memorization. So all of those things, anterior inner ventricular symptom, anterior lateral papillary muscle, and anterior surface of the left ventricle, should not surprise you because they all are anterior and this is the left anterior descending artery. Now, what about the left circumflex? Well, it's called circumflex because it winds around the heart to supply the posterior wall of the left ventricle. Note that this view is anterior and this is posterior. Note that the left circumflex supplies the anterior lateral papillary muscle, which is why it's not the most commonly ruptured papillary muscle because it's also supplied by the LAD. One incredibly high yield related point is that the posterior medial papillary muscle is only supplied by the posterior descending artery. And this makes it one that's prone to infarction and rupture because it does not have a black of blood supply like the anterior lateral papillary muscle does. Now what about the right coronary artery? It delivers blood into the right ventricle via some acute marginal branches, and in 85% of the population, the RCA divides and gives rise to the posterior descending artery. In 8% of people, the PDA arises from the left circumflex, and in the remaining 7%, it comes together as a contribution from both the circumflex as well as the right coronary artery. Do not worry about memorizing these percentages, just remember that most people are right dominant. If it helps you, you can remember that most people are right handed, and just like most people are right handed, the right coronary artery is the dominant side of the heart and that it usually gives rise to the posterior descending artery. So that's the arterial supply of the heart, but where do the veins of the heart drain into? Well, same place veins from anywhere ultimately drain into, so just like the IVC and the SVC, coronary blood drains via the coronary sinus into the right atrium. You would therefore expect to see a dilated coronary sinus with elevated right atrial pressures. What other physical exam findings might you expect to see if this were the case? Good, so you might see JVD or jugular venous distension as well as peripheral edema and ascites. So before we do a review of the relationship between ECGs and a coronary distribution, we need to do a brief review of axis. You don't need to memorize degrees for the purpose of this video, but just take a look at the general directions of each lead. So 2, 3, and AVF, as many of you probably know, are pointing inferiorly, so we call those the inferior leads. Whereas 1 and AVL are pointing laterally, specifically towards the left side, so we call that the lateral leads. And then AVR is kind of doing its own thing, pointing towards the right side. So now you guys know which leads go in which directions, but which coronary arteries do each of these respond to? So let's start by looking at lead 1 and AVL. If you see changes here, particularly ST elevations, you should think of the circumflex. Recall from the last slide that these are the lateral leads and the lateral side of the heart is where the circumflex sits. Similarly, for leads 2, 3, and AVF, you should think of the right coronary artery. For leads V1 through V4, think LAD. And for leads V5 and V6, think LAD or circumflex. This will be reviewed again in the CV pathology section, so take a look at those and see how much you can remember. Now let's take a look at the AV and SA nodes. The SA node is commonly supplied by the RCA via the SA nodal artery. The AV node is commonly supplied by the PDA, or the posterior descending artery, which, as we stated earlier, branches off of the RCA. So with that, if somebody has an RCA infarct, what might you see? 
but you might expect to see significant bradycardia or heart block due to SA or AV nodal dysfunction. This is because the SA node is the pacemaker, setting the pace at the 60 to 100 beats per minute that we're all familiar with. The last high yield fact is the relationship between the most posterior part of the heart with an important nerve. Your question might go something like this. A 54-year-old female with a history of rheumatic disease has been followed by a cardiologist for mitral stenosis and has been experiencing worsening hoarseness and dysphagia over the last few months. Well, the whole point of this question is to make sure you understand the anatomic relationships between the left atrium, which is the most posterior portion of the heart, with the esophagus and the left recurrent laryngeal nerve, which is a branch of the vagus nerve. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve loops under the ligamentum arteriosum on the way back to the head. So it essentially loops under the aorta. In a woman with long-standing mitral stenosis, let's work through what would happen. So we would have chronically elevated pressures in the left atrium due to mitral valve stenosis. Eventually, as a result, the left atrium is going to increase in size until it starts compressing surrounding structures. So what can happen as a result of this? Well, you probably already guessed it from me mentioning it, but you can get impingement of the left recurrent laryngeal nerve. Do you guys remember what this innervates? Right, that would be the intrinsic muscles of the larynx. So compression of it would cause hoarseness. Finally, let's take a look at the association between the LA and the left main stem bronchus. So the left main stem bronchus, as you're seeing here, sits right over the left atrium. So what other finding might you expect on chest x-ray? Right, that would be elevation of the left main stem bronchus. So we have the right main stem bronchus here, and the left main stem bronchus, a bit hard to see, but it's more horizontal. And in addition to that, note that where the left atrial contour would normally be right around here, we have it ballooned out. I want to drive home one important last point regarding the positioning of the heart. So which side of the heart is this? Correct, that would be the right side of the heart, and you can see we're getting a little bit of liver in here, just to confirm that. The point of me bringing this up is to point out that the right side of the heart is anterior, whereas the left side is posterior. And therefore, the RV is more prone to penetrating trauma, and this picture is actually that of a patient with a gunshot wound, with air shown here in the pericardial space. Notice also that the esophagus sits behind the left side of the heart, which is why cardiologists commonly do transesophageal echocardiograms to get a picture of that side of the heart. So here we can see an important image of the layers of the heart. The outermost layer is the pericardium, which is composed of a fibrous outer layer and a serous inner layer. The serous pericardium is composed of two layers, the parietal or body wall layer and the visceral or organ layer. The visceral layer of serous pericardium is often referred to as epicardium. The space between the parietal and visceral layers is the pericardial cavity. Only a tiny amount of ultrafiltrate should be present to lubricate the visceral and parietal pericardium that are facing each other to allow for motion of the chambers. The pericardium itself is innervated by the phrenic nerve and often leads to referred pain when the pericardium is irritated, as in pericarditis. And just to complete our discussion, we have the myocardium, which is the bulk of the heart, as well as the endocardium, which is the part of the heart that the blood sees. All right, time for a question. So a 67-year-old man presents to the emergency department with diaphoresis and crushing chest pain that radiates down his left arm. An ECG shown below is obtained and his troponin eye level is high. He is taken to the cardiac catheterization unit where he is definitively diagnosed. So assuming this man's coronary vasculature is right dominant, which of the following areas is most likely to be spared after this event? So what do we see on our ECG here? Well, we have ST elevations in 2, 3, and AVF, consistent with an inferior MI, which is supplied by the RCA. So we know we have some sort of right coronary artery infar. And the question states that this patient has a dominant right coronary vasculature, so now we just need to remember what the right coronary artery supplies. I'll give you a second to think about it. Right, that would be the anterior intraventricular septum. Good. So we know that B can't be true because the AV node is supplied by the right coronary artery. We said that the heart is right dominant, so we know that the posterior interventricular septum, which is supplied by the posterior descending artery, cannot be the correct answer. For the same reason, the right ventricle and SA node are out. 